안녕하십니까. Hello and welcome to Pyeongchang Peace from 2021. My name is Kim Min Hae. I'll be your mistress of ceremonies. For this particular session, I'd like to thank everyone who are joining us both online and offline, and thank you very much for being with us. Following yesterday, we are having a second day of the forum, and we believe that this will be filled with interesting lectures and presentations. So I'd like to ask you for your participation to the end. This is the third uh, Pyeongchang Peace Forum based on the uh, Peace New Deal or the Action Plan. We are having discussions across five different agenda items, economy, sports, DMZ, peace zone, UN SDGs, and public diplomacy, and tie them in with various measures to practice peace. This session is the sports session two session, and we are going to be discussing the examples of different former conflict countries and how we can ease conflicts and promote peace. We are going to look at the cases of Germany, Ireland, and Ukraine. And furthering from that, we're going to try to discuss desirable direction forward for inter-Korean sports exchange here at the Korean Peninsula. I would like to introduce Kim Kyung Sung, who is the Peace Cooperation Officer for Gangwon-do, and I would like to introduce him to you now. He is serving as the Peace Cooperation Officer in Gangwon and contributing to a peace and harmony through sports exchange. I'd like to hand over the microphone to him. Hello, I've just been introduced. I would like to introduce a Park sang Chol of a professor of Gyeonggi University who is going to be moderating the session. He's going to be leading the discussion later on in 2018 in Pyongyang and Chuncheon. He participated in the actual sporting events that were held there. We also have uh, Professor Lee jung of Yonsei University, who's going to be talking about the situation of the case example in Germany. And we also will hear about uh, the issues in Northern Ireland. Because of COVID-19, we are unable to meet with certain of our presenters, such as Magmed Magdiv who is the president of the International Sport Award Organization. He's going to tell us about the situation in Ukraine. And uh, David Mitchell, assistant professor at Trinity College Dublin, would also like to tell us a little bit more about the uh, former conflict situation in Northern Ireland. We also have uh, Lee young former ambassador to Ukraine, who is part of the panel discussants, and Cho yong jun his attorney at law, who is one of our advisors as well. We are also joined by Cho moon professor of sung University, and Kim Jin-ho, a senior staff writer at Kyung-Hyang shin So for now, we would like to turn to a video presentation where we can see uh, the sports exchange opportunities in Gangwon province. Ichunchi 그리고 한반도에 찾아온 나비 효과 스포츠로 쌓아올린 평화의 역사 어떠한 정치적 이념과 갈등도 스포츠의 순수한 가치를 무너뜨릴 수 없습니다 강원도의 힘 스포츠로 이어온 
남북 교류의 역사 2014년 11월 남북의 갈등이 고조되고 군사적 대치 상황까지 이르렀지만 남북을 조축으로 한 제1회 국제유소년 축구대회는 열렸습니다. 그리고 이듬해 남북의 군사적 긴장 상태는 최고조에 이르렀지만 평양에서 열린 제2회 국제유소년 축구대회는 남북 축구 역사상 최다 관중 수를 기록하며 뜨거운 열기로 가득 찼습니다. 남북 관계가 최악으로 치달을 당시 중국에서 열린 제3회 국제유소년 축구대회. 이곳에서 최문순 지사는 북한의 평창 동계올림픽 참가를 공식 요청하였고 김종성 이사장에게 다시 한번 감사의 인사를 표합니다. 기적은 이루어졌습니다. 그리고 2018년 제4회 국제유소년 축구대회. 남한 선수단은 용로를 통해 북한 땅을 밟았고. 서울 평양 동시 생중계라는 역사를 다시 쓰며 남북의 긴장 상태를 완화하는 역할을 했습니다. 남북의 정치 상황이 악화되는 시기에도 스포츠 교류는 중단되지 않았다. 위기의 순간에도 남북은 스포츠로 만났다. 비영상 한반도의 중심 강원도는 세계 유일의 분단 지자체로 남북 평화 시대를 잇는 오작교가 될 것입니다. 지난 2008년 평양에서 이루어진 뉴욕 피라모닉 오케스트라 공연. 이 세계의 공연을 성사시킨 주인공 최문순 강원도지사였습니다. 문화예술로 이어지는 평화시대, 이제 강원도가 중심이 됩니다. 평창올림픽의 평화정신은 평창평화포럼에서 더욱 빛나왔습니다. 강원도의 힘, 남북 평화시대의 시작점, 평창. 전국 최초로 남북 교류 사업을 시작했던 강원도는 남북 평화시대의 시작점이었습니다. 남과 북, 갈등과 반목의 시대마다 평화를 잇는 역할을 해온 강원도. 정치적 상황과 군사적 긴장 상황과는 무관하게 추진된다는 원칙을 갖고 이러한 행사를 준비했습니다. 한반도 평화를 넘어 국제 평화 시대를 연 계기가 된2018 평창 동계올림픽. 과거를 징검다리 삼아 이제는 미래를 약속한다. 아시아 최초 2024 동계 청소년 올림픽 유치에 성공한 강원도. 평창 동계 청소년 올림픽은 
경화의 스포츠 축제가 될 것입니다. 선수들은 남강원도와 북강원도를 오갈 것이고 육지의 길로, 하늘의 길로, 바다의 길로 교류하며 새롭게 남북이 가야 할 길을 몸소 보여줄 것입니다. 어게인 2018, 다시 평화 2024. 강원도는 남북 소통의 길을 그동안 꾸준히 닦아왔습니다. 6년 전, 그 뜨거웠던 화합의 무대는 영원히 기억돼야 합니다. 감동을 넘어선 평화의 메시지. 그 기억의 시작은 바로 지금 여기 평창 평화 포럼에서 시작합니다. 안녕하십니까? 기자 연설을 맡은 남북 Hello. My name is Kim Kyung Son and I will be your keynote speaker for today. 주어진 시간이 이제 12분. I have about 12 minutes left. And in this a short period of time, I will try to summarize uh, my comments and tell you uh, what I feel is important. As you've just seen in the video, I think that right now, the 2024 Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games will be a breakthrough in going forward with the peace process here in the Korean Peninsula, given all of the changes that we've seen. So now I'd like to talk about inter-Korean exchange, sports exchange, and the role that private sector and local municipalities have to play. I think that there are about 211 FIFA countries, whereas there are 195 UN member states. The ROK's international standing is quite high, both in terms of UN member states and FIFA rankings. However, if we look at the US, China, Japan, Russia, if we compare our standing with those neighboring countries, then it's quite low because of uh, North Korean sanctions, denuclearization, all of these different political tensions are making it very difficult for the two Koreas on the Korean Peninsula to determine their own destinies. This political structure is what's making that very difficult. However, sports exchange can be a breakthrough for us. Sports exchange is the UN spirit, is the Olympic spirit, and it is free from the influences of uh, chorus relations. So it is something that we can expand further on. We are one people, but we stand on two countries with two regimes. Given this political situation, it is important for the two Koreas to take charge and take ownership of our own destiny, and we can do so through expanding sports collaboration. Now, that can be a way for us to ease the political tensions between the two Koreas. However, even with the sports exchange, the government, the administration, is swaying sports exchange because of the different uh, North Korean policies that are put in that are always changing depending on which administration is in power. Right now, there are uh, different North Korea policies in place, and I want to discuss the shortcomings of those North Korea policies and how the private sector and the local governments can complement this role of the federal government. In May of 2006, in Pyongyang, we signed the inter-Korean sports contract. It was a contractual agreement between the two parties, and with governmental approval, there were 22 counts of sports exchange between the two Koreas. From 2006 to 2008, in just three years, twice a year, there were uh, youth soccer teams in the ROK that visited the DPRK, and the DPRK's soccer team also visited South Korea four times. So there were about 10 different counts of a sports exchange just in the field of soccer uh, between the two current two nations. However, under the Lee myung -bak administration, after the second nuclear testing conducted by the DPRK, the sports exchange was effectively con cut. and. 
the two sports exchange commissions of South Korea and the DPRK had no choice but to continue our exchange by meeting in China. Lee Myung-bak's uh, pressure on the DPRK was not able to sustain change from the DPRK, but because of the pressures placed on the DPRK, in fact, they made change impossible. Under Park Geun-hye administration, their sports exchange between the two Koreas was allowed again. There was the RE Sports Cup event that was organized by the two sides. And in August of 2014, in Yeonton of Gyeonggi-do province, there was an exchange of artillery fire because of uh, propaganda leaflets. However, despite that, the two teams met in Yeonton of Gyeonggi-do and the RE Sports Cup was successfully hosted. And this RE Sports soccer match effectively helped to ease tensions, military tensions between the two Koreas. The next year in Pyongyang, inter-Korean soccer exchange continued. In August of 2015, in a border regions, because of a landmine incident, uh, one of our uh, fish officers was hurt, and because of uh, propaganda issues and propaganda leaflet issues, we were standing at the brink of war. However, Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, different local municipalities and sports exchange associations worked together to successfully host the Ari Sports Cup Games. The Ari Sports Cup Games, despite the military tensions, allowed for dialogue and even a meeting of uh, separated family members. So even within military tensions, Ari Sports Cup established itself. And in January of 2016, because of the fourth nuclear weapons testing, Park and he cut down all ties with DPRK, including uh, shutting down the liaison office. However, the sports exchange tried to continue on after continuous efforts. In December of 2017, in Kunming, China, the RA Sports Cup Games were resumed. The next year, Pyeongchang Winter Olympics were to be held in 2018. Governor Choi Moon Sun asked the DPRK counterparts to send in a DPRK Olympic team to uh, the ROK. And we saw a destiny unfold in 2018 during the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. The 2024 Gangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games will bring about uh, new hope for us. As the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games did, the Seoul performance team went to Pyongyang to perform in April of that year. And Pyongyang promised in turn to send a performance team in August. This led to the Panmunjom Declaration on April 17th, and the Minister of Unification sent in a de delegation to have successful exchange in the field of basketball. However, the September 19th joint statement saw more agreements between the two sides. However, even before the ink had dried on the uh, September 19 joint statement, we had to sign the working group agreement with Korea and the US. The DPRK was angry at this, and we went to another stalemate. There were these great promises made in spring with the performance team heading to DPRK, but the performance team was not able to come back to, uh, was not able to come to South Korea, and the basketball team was not able to come in July either. The sports exchange, a lot of these the sports collaborations, reached a fever pitch in April, but they were not able to have a sustained change in the fall. In August of 2018, in Gangwon-do, our students got on the bus and uh, went by land, by bus, uh, to Pyongyang to compete in the Air Sports Cup. And in October, as promised, the Pyongyang uh, athletes got on a bus, and they also came down to across the southern border to compete with the ROK. This is the answer. The sports collaborations and sports exchange have continued on when they were organized and hosted by the private sector. So public sector sports exchange may have 
been postponed or cut effectively because of political tension. But private sector participation continued on. And this is something that we have to remember. The 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics legacy can continue to be inherited and maintained and expanded for the 2024 Gangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games. Gangwon Do Province and the youth associations, the private sector youth associations, have uh, collectively launched a support committee to foster change through the Gangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games. We are going to create about a fund of 20 million US dollars to engage in various projects, invite teams from 50 different vulnerable countries around the world, uh, provide training support in Kawando, and if we can do so, the athletes from these 50 different countries will be able to come to Kawando, get on bus, and they can fly from Yangyang to Kalma by air, and they can go from Sokcho to Onsong by sea. This is sports exchange, so it's also a, the only way for us to bypass the UN's North Korea sanctions. This can allow for us to jointly host various games and activities in both North Korea and South Korea. Well, where can we begin these activities? We can begin with the 2024 Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games Support Committee. And this is not something that is just going to be done by Kangwon Province. The government should uh, organize a special committee to provide various levels of support. We have this opportunity in front of us. The government was unable to do this, but the private sector and local municipalities have continued to do this, even despite various levels of political tension. Right now, we have gone, the two Koreas have gone back to a point before the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. The support committee can help us to go into the future, and we do hope that we can find a solution to that today. Thank you. Hello. I am Park Sang Chul, the moderator for this session. Actually, the keynote speaker took my job as a moderator. So I'm not going to be uh, repeating what was said, but um, it's very meaningful. So let me just touch upon a few points. So we're wearing these um, face masks, and all of you have you know, braved through the difficulties to come here to attend the meeting today. Thank you very much. So Pensia is probably the cleanest area um, in the Republic of Korea, and this very important meeting is being held today. And I'm here as a moderator for this very important meeting that gives me a lot of um, delight and pleasure and especially Moon Soon Che, who is the governor of uh, Gangwon province, who is joining us here today despite his very busy schedules. Thank you for being here today, Governor Che. So the term peace, the notion of peace is critically important, but there are two different perspectives. There is a passive peace and also um, active peace, but there's true peace, genuine peace, and there's fake peace. For example, when there's no war, then we say that there's peace, but real genuine peace is something that we have to work to make, make sure that peace becomes very visible for here to stay, but there are ideological conflicts between the two Koreas, but we really don't see any practical actions being taken on the ground. For example, those conflict uh, countries and the conflict areas Yes, um, they believe that they have to promote sports or cultural exchanges to achieve peace. But of course, cultural activities, um, of course, it comes with a lot of difficulties as well. So we can really do that through the universal values of sports. So President Kim, um, he's a peace cooperation officer, who's also the president of SNKS, the South North Korea Sports Exchange Association, believe that football, the soccer, really holds much potential potential for the Korean Peninsula in terms of exchange and cooperation. Uh, we've seen the division of Germany and also Ireland. Um, there will be a presentation that will uh, follow shortly after. Uh, a lot of conflict and disputes there as well. 
So all in all, through sports, genuine practical peace really can be achieved. So the topic at hand is very relevant uh, to us uh, living, in the DPR, uh, living in South Korea as well as those in DPRK as well. I think really you should use this moment to study this subject in greater depth. We have very esteemed speakers over here. They're the practitioners. I probably don't need to spend any time uh, introducing uh, the speakers, but because I'm the moderator over here, I would like to ask everyone to please uh, keep to their time constraints. It's not 12 minutes, it's actually 10 minutes. And the panelists, of course, do not try to use up that uh, 10 minutes. Uh, just probably focus on your key messages. I think that's going to be enough. So, looking at the list of the speakers over here, I understand um, we have Mr. Magomed, Magomed Magdiv, who is the uh, president of the International Sports Award Organization, the Golden Mongoose, who was a former uh, minister of sports in Ukraine. Um, this is a very important international word. Mr. Kim, I believe you received your word from the Golden Mongoose organization. Now, Mr. Mcdeef during the Pyeongchang uh, well, is actually proposing that this international peace of word uh, should be established for the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympics. And I really hope that uh, this is going to deliver a very important message to you today. My name is Magomed Magdeev and I am head and founder member of the Golden Mongoose International Sports Awards. I am also president of the All-Ukrainian Beach Wrestling Federation and president of the National Grappling Federation of Ukraine. I am personally very glad to participate in this honorable conference, the Pyeongchang Peace Forum via video. The International Sport Award Golden Mongoose organization in the Ukraine annually awards a prize. We actively seek out those individuals across the globe who have made outstanding contribution to the development of all sports at every level and especially for promoting international sports peace and its influences. We would like to wholeheartedly congratulate Mr. Kung Sung Kim, who won the Golden Mongoose Award in 2019. As you may know, he has made so many contributions to international sports exchanges and tremendous interchanges between South and North Korean sports. Sports exchanges between the nations has been so effective with the communication channels making relaxation of conflicts and tensions. And this was shown in the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. The Ari Sports Cup International Youth Sports Competition, which the Gangwondu Province and the South and North Korea Exchange Committee organized, has important roles such as participating cheering squads, and working with the North Korean team for the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Even though there had been a nuclear test explosion and the launching of the ICBM in 2017. We would also like to highly praise Mr. Moon Soon Choi who is the governor of Gangwondu province and his contribution to international peace during the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. We also offer honorable congratulations to the governor and people in the Gangwondu province for succeeding the 2024 Gangwondu Province Youth Winter Olympics, which is the first major event in the Gangwon Province since January 2020. We hope you will be able to hold a joint event 
in the 2024 Gangwon Youth Winter Olympics, including teams from South Gemwon Pyeongchang and North Gemwon Wonsan. We really appreciate your efforts to try your best for achieving peace at the Pyeongchang Peace International Forum. We, as the representatives of the Mongoose Organisation, propose the International Sports Peace Award for recognising the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. And we are hoping for the success of the 2021 Pyeongchang Peace Forum. The International Sports Peace Award in Ukraine has been given annually to individuals and groups who have contributed to international sports peace. And we hope it will not only be a symbol of the opening of the Winter Olympics, but also be the propulsion for the success of the 2024 Gangwon Youth Winter Olympics. We again sent our heartfelt appreciation for your individual contributions for developing the South and North Korean sports exchanges. For all your excellent work and personal commitment, thank you. <coughs> Big round of applause to the speaker, first of all. So in 2024, there will be the winter uh, youth Olympics to be held in Gangwon. I think his message uh, really focused a lot on a lot of tasks. And I think there are views and opinions coming um, online. And the second speaker I'm going to be introducing to you is uh, Professor Lee Jong Su, um, who will talk about the uh, promotion of peace through sports, taking the example from West and East Germany. There will be real-time questions coming to the organizers. So after Professor Nam finishes his presentation later on, so President Kim, first of all. So the the previous uh, speaker, Mag, uh, Mag, uh, Magdiv, um, he talked about the establishment of the sports award. Uh, there was actually a question about the uh, history of sports. Perhaps you can use two minutes to explain and to give an answer to that. So I'm going to invite Dr. Lee. Peace promotion through sports exchanges, especially focusing on the examples of the former uh, two Germanys. Please welcome the speaker with a big round of applause. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've just been introduced. My name is Lee jong a professor at the law school at Yonsei University. I studied in Germany, and I've studied the division and unification of the two Germanys. I've written papers on that issue. And when I was asked to write uh, give a presentation on this topic, I was glad to do so. I think that this is a very important forum, and I am personally uh, deeply pleased and find it an honor to give this presentation here at the Pyeongchang Peace Forum. The photograph that you're looking at right now, it, it represents the reality of a sports uh, between the two Germanys and after they're unified. This is the uniform of West Germany and East Germany, the various uh, Olympic teams. The DDR is East Germany, and what you see on the other side, was the uniform, the old uniform that West Germans wore. In German, the Wir gegen uns here means that we represent ourselves. This is a good representation of the division of the Germany, of the German state, and this is what I wanted to show you today. I think more so than Ireland, I think many Koreans are more familiar with the German division because it's been heavily reported in the press, but in 1945, Germany lost the war, and both sides of uh, Germany, both East and West Germany, were devastated like this. The Berlin Wall was built in 1961. This erection of the Berlin Wall 
was a very important point, an inflection point for sports exchange for the two uh, Germanys. Because before the Berlin Wall was built, even after German division, there was a lot of a sports exchange. But after the Berlin Wall was built, for a time, there was a complete halt to sports exchange between the two Germans. In 1970, the uh, Chancellor of Germany at the time, Willy Brandt, went to the monument to the ghetto heroes. And as he lay flowers, he suddenly got down on his knees. And this image really help to dispel the division of the two Germanys and also to get away with the uh, shroud of Cold War era, Cold War on the two Germans, the two Germanys. And then we saw the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. So for about 45 years, we've seen these different photographs, which I think are the four best symbols that represent what happened over these decades in Germany. I think you know very well what happened along the course of history after Germany lost the war. There was a division between the two Germanys. The three allied powers occupies different zones in East Germany. And as I mentioned before, 1961, with the Berlin Wall that was built, this led to the rise of the Cold War era. The Cold War era heavily impacted sports exchange. When I look at the literature review, even in the field of constitutional studies, legal scholars all say that even before the uh, Berlin Wall was built, there was still some level of sports exchange between the two Germanys. But after Berlin Wall was built, even academic exchange came to a standstill. And as I mentioned before, the uh, Chancellor of West Germany, Willy Brandt, said that they must do away with uh, the Cold War, that they have to bring about change through rapprochement, through a new Eastern policy that he called Ostpolitik. This had an impact on various sectors, including culture and the arts, and even sports. And in 1972, the 1972 Basic Treaty was signed. And in 1974, there was a sports protocol that was signed between the two Germanys. And in 1989, ultimately, the Berlin Wall was brought down. Some details regarding sports exchange between the two Germanys are found here on this slide. Uh, scholars all say that the sports exchange between the two Germanys can be divided into three phases, the initial phase, the interphase, and the growth phase. After division, the sports exchange between the two Germanys took place along uh, these lines. I don't have a lot of time, so I don't think I can go into detail with each line item. But I can tell you that after division, in 1946, there was a something called a small sports border exchange that was agreed upon by the two countries, by the two states. And the Berlin Agreement was signed in 1952. But then, after Berlin Wall was built in 1961, which brought about Cold War, there was a Dusseldorf resolution that was signed, which effectively brought about an end to sports exchange. In 1956, from the Winter Olympics to the 1964 Summer Olympics, uh, Germany's sent unified team for all six Olympic Games from 1965 and on. In German, it's called It's called a black deal, which allowed for partial resumption of sports exchange. And then in 1974, the chairman of the sports associations of both Germanys signed a sports exchange protocol in 1981. The leaders of the two Germanys signed a summit level agreement on sports exchange. So from West Germany in 1987 alone, there are about 877 counts of sports exchange where 22,000 people went to East Germany for sports exchange and a corresponding number of East Germans came over to West Germany as well. 
In these, these different sports exchange measures, there were different principles and uh, rules and protocols that were signed to facilitate sports exchange. One of the rules was a principle of mutual respect, no political propaganda, no political demagoguery, that this was only going to be purely about sports. However, the problem was that the two Germanys had different goals in mind, even as they engage in sports exchange, because with the West Germany, what they wanted to do was increase mutual exchange, uh, increase national unity, and maintain a sense of national homogeneity. However, for East Germany, what they wanted to do was strengthen the socialist system and promote the uh, superiority of socialism and enhance its international status as a state. Despite the fact that the two Germanys all wanted different things, sports exchange greatly contributed to affirming national identity and maintain ties. And in fact, the sports exchange later served as a foundation for unification. In German, we say wir sind ein Volk, which means we are one nation. These charts here show you what followed after division. And right before unification, these different counts of uh, sports exchange activities and events that were held, they were frequent, uh, often sports exchange. And in fact, youth sports exchange measures were quite frequent uh, in the sports of handball and soccer. There was a lot of exchange activities that were held. As you can see here, it says, uh, even if the countries the country was divided, we became one through handball. That was another expression that was found in Germany at the time. Sometimes uh, the two Germany sent in two different teams. Sometimes they were sent in unified teams. In 1978, West Germany won at the World Handball Championships held in Soviet Union. And after the West German team won, the East German captain and the East German athletes came over to congratulate the West German uh, team. And the same goes for soccer as well. In 1974, during the West German World Cup, and in 1990, at the Bristol World Cup, the German team won. And they said that we may compete with each other, but we are one nation. This was an expression that came out at the time. The East German team and the West German team were forced to compete with each other. In fact, at the uh, European preliminaries held in Brussels in 1990, for the World Cup, they had to compete each other in the same group. West Germany, later on, uh, made it to the final round, but East Germany wins 2-0. This is a national uh, championships that were held in 1977 in East Germany. As you can see, there's their cards have been uh, put up saying Germany, Democratic Republic, our homeland forever. We see something similar in the DPRK as well, but just in Germany, in East Germany 1977, we saw something like this with the uh, active sports exchange between the two countries. They've sent in unified Olympic teams or separate Olympic teams in some cases. So uh, this is the kind of Olympic history that we saw over the years for Germany. When they sent in unified teams, the flag would be used, the Olympic flag was used as, a, as an alternative, and the national anthem was replaced by Beethoven's Ode an die Freude instead of the usual national anthem. The East German athletes would be very proudly uh, standing as diplomats in sporting gear. And even, in fact, the uh, East German government would tell them that they are effectively diplomats, but in sports uniforms. Uh, this uh, sports exchange was also very important uh, from the perspective of East Germany as well, as evidenced by these different examples.
As I mentioned before, uh, Chancellor Willy Brandt was very influential in doing away with the Cold War era along uh, Germany, and he said, peace is not everything, but without peace, everything is nothing. This is a great expression that he said, and this expression is deeply resonant, not just in Germany, but across many other countries, especially in a divided country like ours. And we know that this message is important because peace is important, especially when right now we cannot engage in political exchange with the DPRK. We have to find other breakthroughs, such as sports exchange, to try to reaffirm our national unity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that what you said is very clear and very obvious. I mean, when the DPRK plays soccer or when China plays soccer, I mean, if the DPRK and China are facing off each other, who are you going to cheer? Uh, obviously, you're going to support the DPRK team. And if we were to compete against the U.S., I think the DPRK would support us. So sports exchange is really very important. We may talk about peace and all of these grand visions, but I think sports exchange is so important, and I think that this session is uh, very meaningful as well. Um, and Ireland, uh, and I'm sure, uh, is a very uh, well-known story when it comes to conflict. Um, this is not something that I'm very knowledgeable of, but there will be a video made by Professor David Michel, associate professor, I'm currently studying uh, teaching at Trinity College Dublin, who will deliver a presentation through a video to talk about the role of sports and the peace process in uh, North, Northern Ireland. And the same Ireland case will be explained by Professor Nam Myung Ho afterwards, what was the essential role that sports played uh, in Northern Ireland peace process. Let's first take a look at the video. Hello, I'm delighted and honored to be speaking to the PyeongChang Peace Forum. And I'm just sorry I can't be with you there in person. I'd like to congratulate Governor Moon Soon Choi of Gangwon Do and all the organizers on what looks like a terrific event on such an important topic. I am in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where I work at Trinity College Dublin. And one of my research interests uh, is the link between sport and peace. Now, the Olympic movement has always been associated with peace and the values of conflict resolution. Uh, but we know that sport has also often appeared to promote hostility and conflict. I'm going to talk very briefly about the role of sport in the Northern Ireland peace process. Northern Ireland is regarded as one of the most successful peace processes in the world. But we still have many problems and we are still a divided society. There are two main communities here, unionists who are pro-British and mainly Protestant uh, and nationalists who are pro-Irish and mainly Roman Catholic. From the late 1960s until the late 1990s, there was a violent conflict here, usually called the Troubles. And this involved unionists, nationalists and the British state uh, and it was fought over whether Northern Ireland should be part of a united Ireland or should stay in the United Kingdom. The conflict mostly ended in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which created a power sharing government. So violence is over, but people still live in separate areas. They still go to separate schools. They go to different churches. They socialize separately and they even play different sports. Nationalists play Gaelic sports like Gaelic football and hurling, and unionists play sports uh, which uh, are associated with Britain like rugby, cricket and hockey. Both sides like football, but they support different teams. Now the reality is a little bit more complex than this, but these divisions are broadly true. This means that during the conflict, 
if you were playing a particular sport or wearing a particular jersey, this revealed your identity. And depending on where you were, this could be quite dangerous. Some sporting events, especially in football, became violent. So sport very much appeared to be part of the problem here and not part of the solution. However, the sporting world has played a peace building role, especially since the Good Friday Agreement. And there are four main ways in which it has done this. First, sport has been used as a tool for reconciliation at a grassroots level. For example, an organization called Peace Players uses basketball, which is seen as a neutral sport in Northern Ireland, to bring Protestant and Catholic young people together. But there are many, many other projects like this as well. Much of this work has been funded by the government and by the European Union. Second, the governing bodies of football, Gaelic games and rugby have had very positive relationships, even, even better relationships than between our main political parties. Uh, and the governing bodies have cooperated on many projects. Third, the governing bodies themselves have worked hard to change and to make their sports more inclusive. For instance, the governing body of Gaelic Games, the GAA, ended its ban on the membership of the security forces in response to the reform of the police that took place after the Good Friday Agreement. The Irish Football Association conducted a major campaign to remove sectarianism from the game and to encourage people of all backgrounds to support the Northern Ireland football team. And this campaign has been very successful. Fourth, sport has sometimes symbolised change. Unionist and nationalist political leaders have attended matches associated with the other side. The GAA welcomed Queen Elizabeth to its stadium in Dublin in 2011, and this was a major gesture of reconciliation. Also, some Northern Ireland sports stars, such as the golfer Rory McIlroy, the boxer Carl Frampton, are popular among Protestants and Catholics. And so, to some extent, they symbolise a shared post-conflict identity. So sport did not bring peace to Northern Ireland, but it has played a positive role in supporting the political changes. Sport is able to connect what is happening at elite level with ordinary people. It can promote political changes taking place and make them meaningful for people. But it cannot work alone. Northern Ireland has shown the limits of what sport can do when there are ongoing political problems. As long as Protestants and Catholics go to separate schools, and as long as there are political arguments over national symbols and cultures, sports efforts to bring people together will struggle. Peace processes can't just be about politicians. Every sector of society has a role to play, and there is much that sport can contribute. Thanks for listening, and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. So, listening to the presentation, you all had the interpretation receivers. So, Northern Ireland really has a complicated process across religions, generations, politics, but these complicated problems are not being addressed through the means of sports. But this is actually simpler on the Korean Peninsula. I think we could get very positive views on this uh, through the panel discussion. Now we're going to uh, invite Professor Nam to give us a more detailed presentation on the examples of Nor Northern Ireland peace process. Hello, my name is Nam Young-ho. Uh, Professor Lee chung Su of uh, Yonsei University said he was very glad to accept uh, this uh, presentation, but uh, I have to say I was less enthusiastic because I didn't actually want to be here. Uh, I 
was not sure whether I could squeeze in uh, what little I know into the 15 minutes of presentation. But now it's uh, gone down to 12 minutes. And in fact, I think it's actually gone down to 10 minutes. I think I'm going to be all over the place. And this is mostly because I lack the necessary knowledge and wisdom. So I'd like to ask you for your uh, understanding. Um, and for Mr. David Mitchell, in he gave a five-minute presentation. I wanted to elaborate on that as well. And if uh, this was not being broadcast on YouTube, I would like to use a very colorful language. But because I have a living to make, I will try to not do that. This is the uh, table of contents. And I'm going to touch on one, two for one and a half minutes, four minutes for number three, and the rest for four and five. I don't think I'm going to make it, but I will do my best. This is the uh, current status of Northern Ireland. It's part of, uh, you, say, it's, you say, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. What we consider part of UK is that island that you see on the right. And on the left, you see the nation of Ireland. However, you also see Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, about 700 years ago, or about 750 years ago, in fact, the UK colonized Ireland, the island of Ireland, in fact. In the case of Northern Ireland, after various different complex processes in 1921, uh, Southern Ireland became independent. But there are a lot of uh, Protestants in Northern Ireland who wanted to remain in the UK, whereas there was an establishment of an independent state for the first time in 750 years. And this is a source of dispute. So of course, this is not the only source, because this is a very complex issue. Uh, but I just wanted to say uh, that it's the case. And this Ireland is what came about after independence. After independence, Northern Ireland became part of the UK. However, according to the Irish Protestants, they wondered why uh, should we be a part of this? And then there are many different incidents involving PLA. There was a lot of discrimination against Catholics in Northern Ireland, and this is something that we were able to see. This, these are some pictures that I, I took in 2017. Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland. There is a wall here that is set up in the in downtown Belfast to stop Catholics and Protestants from fighting each other. You would see many of these different wall murals and graffiti, uh, free all political prisoners and internments and administrative detention. You know, if you remove the English Army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, as you said about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts would be in vain. And British rule, smash storm on. This is all in a UK territory. And then so there are some graffiti that is in that is pro UK. And then here, this is the Shankill Road. I don't think I have enough time to elaborate on this. But if you go over here, there's the UK militia. So the British militia, militia. There's militia on both sides where there was bomb terrors, terrorist incidents that occurred here. It says here, this is uh, UK territory. And this graffiti, this wall mural celebrates the birthday of Queen Elizabeth here. This is Vote DUP, Sinn Féin, and smash Sinn Féin here. It says, prepare to bear arms 1914, prepare to bear arms 2004 the Irish side. I'm trying to uh, depict the background of the conflict. Derry is another city. But if you look at the map, it could also be written as London Derry. In fact, the official name is London Derry, but the uh, Irish people call it Derry. And if you go over this bridge, the other side is where Protestants live, and on the opposite side, Catholics live. The EU uh, provided funding to build this bridge. If you see on some of the roofs of the houses, you would look at Derry Happy or IRA. 
all of these different words that are written there. Villages where Protestants lived, it's dairy is spelled out as London dairy. However, on the Irish side, you would see it's na it's called dairy, it's free dairy, and also slogans such as end British internment. Here you would see this is UK soil, but the flag hoisted there belongs to the Irish Republic. This is a bloody Sunday, and Che Guevara, Che Guevara, I think he sent in a statement that is pro-Irish. Here, this is a boy, a plastic bullet killed this 11-year-old boy, and there are, the newspapers are still here uh, to this day, as, along with flowers, an annual Dairy Volunteers Commemoration March, and some pubs here. And if you look at the pubs, if you go inside the ceiling, you would find a Cuba flag. All of these uh, movements against colonialism and imperialism, they are honored here. And this is uh, a memorial for the people who fought against the famine and the crown. The uh, Good Friday Agreement was agreed upon after a lot of different difficulties with soccer, schools, and everyday organizations. As uh, David mentioned in his video, if you go to a Catholic school, if you go to a Protestant school, they com teach completely different things, even if it's the same subject, and particularly when it comes to history. So for a Protestant side, they talk about how uh, the uh, British, the UK pioneer no man's land in the 17th century and spread the gospel, brought industrialization, and etc. But in the Catholic schools, they talk about how UK conquered Catholic Ireland and the Protestants took Catholic land to distribute that among themselves. So the perspectives are very different here. And you would see some of that uh, playing out in everyday lives of people, one of which is the Orange Parade. The Orange Order, Orange Parade, is the largest festival for Northern Ireland Protestants. Uh, the Glorious Revolution led to William of Orange defeating the Catholic King James II. And the, they have to cross over uh, Catholic territory. So there's always a lot of conflict during the Orange Parade. I have a video, but I don't think I can show it to you right now. But in any case, uh, there are these conflict situations that still occur even today through these different uh, present day celebrations and parades. And in fact, if you go to pubs or laundromats and stores and shops, they are also divided and segregated with sports. As David talked about, there is the Gaelic sports, uh, Gaelic football and hurling. That's what you see on the left hand side. And hurling is what you see on the right-hand side. And cricket and uh, rugby. On the right hand, the two sports on the right are typically UK sports. If you go to a Catholic school, they teach you the two sports on the left. I do have a video, but I was not able to show it. It talks about what hurling means to uh, the Irish people. Basically, it talks about how if you are an Irish person, you have to speak the Irish language and you have to play the sport of hurling. That the sport really has to do with the national identity. As I mentioned before, depending on which community you're living in, the sports you play can also be different. And also, it could be the same sport, but you could be in different clubs. For in Belfast, the Protestants typically root for the Linfield Club, whereas the Catholics root for the Cliftonville uh, Club. And in fact, they don't even engage in home and away games. For 30 years, they've only competed in the home stadiums for security reasons. For the Dairy Club, for security reasons as well, they left the Northern Ireland Soccer League and the Dairy Club has been with the Irish Republic League. So, in some cases, in these cases, sports played a role in fomenting more division between the two sides. Sports is all about celebrating each other's differences and cheering and rooting for each other and sometimes even for the other team. And for 
the GAA, the Gaelic Athletic Association, they would, it's a very historic association, as David mentioned, but this was founded with a very specific political purpose in mind, and the GAA said that we are for uh, Ireland. They have about 500,000 members. The 500,000 members are banned from joining the military or police. After the Good Friday Agreement, this uh, provision was abandoned, and then the GAA members were free to join the military or police. However, there was one GAA member who was a police officer, his name is Ronan Kerr, who was killed by Protestant nationalists who opposed the peace process. The funeral was officially sponsored by GAA. I was not able to play some of the uh, videos that I brought today, but in this particular one, the GAA president visits a Protestant school and tells the students who want to play Gaelic sports to and encourages the students who want to play Gaelic sports. So these are some of the outreach activities uh, that we've seen. In some games, the Irish teams would not go, or the Irish people, the crowds would not go if a UK national anthem is going to be played, and vice versa. In the case of sports, however, there are these different examples that we see, where still many people have said, a response to the survey, about 84% have said that uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, sports has become more open and inclusive over the last 10 years, and sports is a good way uh, to go beyond uh, differences. There are some great oh, murals and graffiti, despite the uh, issues and challenges. However, the big issue here is Brexit. Brexit is another big challenge. Because with Brexit, what's going to happen between the EU and between the UK, and what's what impact is that going to have on Northern Ireland and with regional integration within Northern Ireland? Well, for this, there was a terrorist incident, and here there was, it says, welcome to Ireland. Welcome to Northern Ireland, it actually said, but the Northern has been spray painted out. But when the, e but when the UK leaves the EU, then what is going to happen with these signage and et cetera? That's another big challenge as well. It's too bad we were not able to hear more about the presentation, but I do think that uh, there are four discussants who I think if uh, I give them about five minutes, maybe we can give a little bit more time to uh, the presenters. For Nam myung we have a question for you. I think uh, this uh, person really listened very closely to your presentation that sports is something that goes beyond a simple hobby, that it has to do with national unity. Yes, can you elaborate your thoughts on that? And also, before we go to the uh, discussions, the Peace Cooperation Officer, Kim kyung Sun. Can you also talk about what does it mean to win the Golden Mongoose and uh, the uh, brief history of uh, sports, in fact? Can you just briefly talk about that as well? Yes, the uh, Ukrainian president of the International Sport Award Organization, Magomed Madiv, he heads this association of the Golden Mongoose, and this is something that is awarded to individual or a group that has contributed to uh, international sports peace. I was also given this award in Odisha in 19, 2019, and 
There are diamonds in this uh, little badge, a uh, medal made of gold, and this is what I uh, was given, what I was presented, and uh, Dr. Magmoded, Magmoded uh, Madiv said that he hopes a similar model can be presented at the uh, Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games. In South Korea and the DPRK, even China, there were dozens of cases where there were sports exchanges that were held, and when the political tension was too high, then we would meet in China, and etc. So there were these private sector-led sports exchange that were done on a regular basis. Uh, the Kyungpyong soccer club model, which was active during the Japanese colonial years, was benchmarked for these uh, sports exchange activities. Thank you very much. And as the uh, moderator, I have to uh, play devil's advocate because we have to end exactly on time at 2.30. That means... Five minutes is still a little bit too long for our discussions, but I just want to uh, ask that you all to keep within your time limit of five minutes and just keep to your key message. First is uh, Mr. Lee Young, former ambassador to Ukraine. Please give him a big round of applause. Yes, hello. I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to this very important session. I'm a diplomat, so. You might feel that that is far removed from sports, but I was able to look at sports from different angles, and I think that is why I was invited here. I was surprised by two things at the Pentagon Peace Forum. The 2018, after the Winter Olympics, I thought that that was going to be an end to everything, but with the Pyeongchang Peace Forum, this was held every year since then, which is surprising. And then we are leading up to the 2024 Kangon Winter Youth Olympic Games. The fact that we were able to win this bid is also very surprising as well. The peace process is a process, as you can say, so we have to have this a strategic mindset. And I would like to congratulate the governor of Kangon the province and all the organizers for making that possible. We're here discussing peace, and I think that we peace is more desperate than ever before, more urgent than ever before. Yesterday at another session, at the geopolitical session, we talked about how the U.S. and China hegemony are impacting our efforts toward peace and also the U.S. leaving the Eurasian continent and the recent COVID-19 pandemic. These are all severe challenges, security and economic challenges and crises on all of us. So right now we are facing an attack to peace on all fronts. In preparing for my presentation, I was able to realize that sports plays such an important role that it is a contributing factor not just to peace but to prosperity and to national happiness and to the development of the community, national development and national unity as well. It's a very powerful weapon. And in various sessions, we've been discussing UNSDGs. And I think that uh, sports is really closely tied in with UNSDGs. The SDGs can be five Ps, uh, peace, prosperity, planet, people, and partnerships. The five Ps represent UN SDGs, and I think that sports can really realize these uh, five P visions as uh, set forth by UN SDGs. And another thing is that Korea is already a great power in terms of sports. We are a middle power. This means that we can prevent the politicization of sports. And because Korea is a divided country, there is always an urgency for peace. And the international community would definitely sympathize with our efforts toward peace. We have a very good national image, and we already are a sports powerhouse. We've had a sports grand slam, for example, in K sports, in lead sports, in e sports, and even uh, social sports. We see all of these elements being very successful in Korea. And we can combine sports together with ICT technology because that is also very important as well. Korea is a digital powerhouse, and that can allow us uh, to stand, have a very good standing. In 2018, the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics were held, and I'm very proud of the successful hosting because the uh, Seoul Olympics were a peace Olympics, whereas the Pyeongchang Olympics were a prosperous Olympics. We participated as a G10 economic power, and 
I think I remember when I was in Ukraine at the time, I was really congratulated by uh, the Grand Slam that we achieved. I think that that really allowed us to use sports to go beyond just promoting peace, but to bring prosperity and happiness to the people. And as a diplomat, I am very indebted to sports for Taekwondo. Uh, Taekwondo was something that we were able to use to uh, facilitate more uh, public diplomacy and Park Hang Seo and various other coaches, you know. These coaches also, Korean born coaches, have gone on to do so well over overseas. And Korea's young athletes have also done an amazing job. In 2014, we know the uh, Eurasian Bicycle Caravan event was also held, which was a successful event. So when I was working overseas in diplomatic consuls and embassies, sports was really a way for us to facilitate public diplomacy. And these various facilities and infrastructure are something that we can be very proud of. We have the bicycle infrastructure, the Tule roads, the Ole roads, the bicycle paths, there are 10 million people in Korea who bike. So this kind of infrastructure is something that we can promote well to the world. And by way of conclusion, I would like to say that uh, sports can be used to go beyond peace and cooperation, but this is actually something that can facilitate green industries and tie with tie in with UN SDGs. So we have to really expand the scope of sports. So in 2024, with the Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games, maybe we can make use of sports ODA resources to try to tie that in with UN SDG strategies and with the young uh, dreamers, athletes, we can do more outreach to vulnerable countries around the world. And as I mentioned before, we can make use of the world's best bicycle and hiking path infrastructures to facilitate more tourism. And these are areas where we can share more of our development experiences abroad. Thank you very much. We have such distinguished speakers, and I'm sorry I had to ask you to hurry along. Next, we would like to hear from Chu Yongjun, who is an attorney at law and has also served as a DA and a judge in this region. Thank you. Hello. So I'm going to uh, make my remarks very brief. So ever since the two Koreas were divided in 1991, there was a framework agreement reached and adopted. And in 2000, uh, there was a June 16th a declaration. And in 2017, there was another declaration uh, that was made at the summit level. So this inter-Korean relations why aren't we aren't we seeing any significant progresses here? It is because of the uh, political dynamism that's at play, especially as we're trying to solve these issues from a political perspective or maybe unilateral humanitarian point of view in trying to resolve these issues, which is not really uh, leading us to anywhere. And I think by having this sports lens uh, in promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula, I think it is going to prove to be more effective. And continued social exchanges and interactions must take place between the two Koreas. And for this to happen, as Professor Ali rightly pointed out, the two Koreas must learn from other examples, uh, like the two Germanys. In 1971, there was a framework agreement. In 74, sports-related agreement was reached. In 76, sports exchanges agreement was reached between the two Germanys. So institutionally, there was a strong foundation put in place through which East and West Germany were able to actively engage in exchanges. Let's not focus too much on the economic aspects. Try to uh, expand the scope uh, to include social arenas as well as cultural and sports arenas. It will have a positive impact on other areas of exchanges. So we need to really come up with a detailed and concrete agreement on promoting exchanges in these areas, whether it is social, cultural, or sports. I think it would be it would serve us very well if we can set up a joint committee 
for an organization that can oversee these activities. So second, rather than a state or maybe local government or private sector should take the initiative in setting up this organization for promoting uh, inner Korean exchanges across society or culture because you don't have to really deal with sensitive issues. It is therefore a good idea to utilize the uh, local autonomous governments who could provide more relevance to people. We had a revision of law and starting from March of this year, local governments in relation to the inter-Korean cooperation uh, when any policies are established, local governments are authorized to take the take a leading role and uh, this is now being allowed as a result of amendment of a law and the inter-korean relations promotion committee uh, that is responsible for the overall planning and management of the inter-korean relations um, it is very meaningful that the representatives of the local governments are taking part and for sustainable development of the inter-Korean relations and also for social harmony. I just want to emphasize once again the importance of uh, social actors involved in the process. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to invite a professor from Sungshu University, uh, Professor Cho Moon Su. I went to North Korea with him, and he was a vice dean at the university. Um, he's also leading uh, various initiatives for unification university development project. Close yours, Professor Cho. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Cho Moon Su. I think that uh, I have less than three minutes remaining, so I will try to do my best to talk about the sports exchange and talk about uh, Choi Moon Soon, Governor of Gangwon Province, and Kim Kyung San as a Peace Cooperation Officer. So thank you very much and congratulations to you. I want to talk about Youth uh, Olympic Games in 2024. The Kangwon Youth Olympic Games are going to be held. I think that the inter-Korean college level and university level cooperation should be facilitated, and uh, local municipality level cooperation should also be facilitated, which I think is actively uh, possible. I think when we play Go, uh, that could also be a way for us to do, or we can provide uh, some support to social enterprises in 2017, Sungshu University and a DPRK University team worked together on a sports exchange and in 2018. Uh, the New York and Pyongyang uh, peace exchange was also held. And I think that this is really what allow for a peace process in the Korean Peninsula. And I'm very proud that this happened at Sungshu University. So I hope that the ROK and DPRK university level cooperation can be more facilitated. And I do think that this can be uh, made more expanded over the years. I do want to make two uh, proposals to the Pyeongchang Peace Forum together with the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and the 2024 Kangwon Winter Olympics. I think that it's very important for us uh, to uh, have a sort of a Kang Pyeong uh, Winter uh, Peace Olympics. Uh, that could be a way for us to do more. And I think with uh, Magomed Magdiv, we also had a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, his country, but uh, maybe a sports peace award or a sports Nobel Prize is uh, something that we can also uh, think about. I'm going to uh, conclude with these remarks so I can have leave more time for my next panelist. Um, you were able to make your point very concise and within the time constraints, though. Thank you very much. Uh, now, now we're going to invite uh, Mr. Kim Jun Ho, who is a senior staff writer from Kyunghyang Shimun. Uh, we went to North Korea together. And he's such a wonderful writer. I'm sure he's an eloquent speaker. I'm also at the same time. The floor is yours, Mr. Kim. Uh, had I known that I would only be uh, given this short uh, time for my presentation, I probably could have uh, spent that time uh, not preparing for this uh, speech, but maybe taking a t walk outside. But anyway, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, especially, it was very interesting for me to learn about the uh, Northern Ireland's peace process. 
that if you're a North, a Northern Irish, then you have to be able to play, um, how to play hurling, and how sports was not really a symbol of harmony, but it actually became a symbol of conflict and hostilities, confrontation. So it was indeed an interesting presentation. So looking at the um, examples of Germany and Ireland, I came to think the following. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger said that the inter-Korean relations issue, this issue is such an easy um, issue to tackle. Why would we need diplomacy? It is such an easy um, issue to work on, especially if it is compared to um, other um, issues in the region, like North Northern Ireland. But this is quite different. Only 3,500 people, well, I'm not trying to underestimate the number, but not a, a lot of people died um, in the Northern Ireland peace process, but there wasn't a, a war uh, between the same peoples. More than 3 million people lost their lives in the Korean War, so probably we've uh, had to suffer uh, more as a result of uh, the conflict or the war. And looking at how Northern Ireland uh, worked to promote peace there, so after conflict was ended um, during the post-conflict sharing process. In the process of sharing the identity, uh, they had just some different program that came out as a result uh, of reaching that um, agreement. So they had a power sharing, a government, which was born as an initiative to share the identity after the conflict. So this is quite different uh, from what we see uh, in the Korean Peninsula. But I think there are a lot of implications that we can learn as well. Uh, Professor David Mitchell presented that there was an organization, a grassroots organization, Peace Player, uh, focused on uh, the basketball, which is a neutral sport to bring unity amongst the youth, uh, the Protestants uh, community as well as Catholic communities. So as they expanded their roles and influences, uh, the financing came from the European Union and also sport, sports associations and federations. They worked to, together very cooperatively, which led to both of the governments uh, working in cooperation, so it was indeed a bottom-up, a grassroots-driven initiative. That's something that we could um, apply to our case. So I have a question to uh, Dr. Nam. In the Northern Ireland a peace process, this identity-sharing uh, initi initiatives promoted uh, through the means of sports, what would that mean uh, for the Korean Peninsula peace process? what would be the implications for us. And as for Germany, yes, um, I learned a lot from the presentation. Uh, so 25 years ago, uh, when the Berlin Wall broke down, and in 1974, there was a sport protocol agreement uh, reached between the two Germanys. So they were probably very advanced in terms of promoting peace. Uh, maybe it's all about rhetoric uh, when it comes to the Korean Peninsula peace process, as if we're tr going to do everything across sports, society, interactions. Uh, on every occasion, we try to say that we're one people, but we really haven't um, achieved any tangible results, and we really didn't have any blueprint to work on. So that was quite frustrating in a way. So among the sports agreement reached between the two Germanys, that the representatives who are delegated by the sports organizations have to come up with the master plans and have to implement these plans. That was quite um, um, enviable. Although this is, it's a belated step, if we are to design this blueprint, how can we learn from the German case? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, come to an end at 2.30. Uh, I think we can use about five extra minutes to uh, conclude the session. Uh, doctors Nam Myung Ho and Lee Jong Su like to give you about two minutes each to conclude your remarks, and lastly to uh, Kim Kyung Sun, maybe about one minute for you. Thank you for the uh, great question. 
The German division and the uh, division of the Korean Peninsula, as you mentioned before, are very different. Well, ever since the Three Kingdoms era, we were in separate nations, separate kingdoms, and then we became divided. Germany as well, after unification, they're called a German Federalist state. So even with Germany, there was a federalism in place. And after they lost the war in 1945, they were divided. And some of the Federalist states moved over to the other side. So they were a single country. In case of Korea, we were a single country that was divided. But in the case of Germany, there were a Federalist Republic and Federalist states that were later brought together again. And this might seem like a slight difference, but they also have lots of different implications. Willy Brandt, the former chancellor, as I mentioned before, he presented the Ostpolitik and tried to bring about change through rapprochement. After three summit-level talks, a sports protocol was signed between the two Germanys. In Korea, as well, I think that has implications when there are political tensions. We can completely disregard those political tensions but, and still engage in sports exchange. I think that is possible. And as you've said, Mr. Kim, there, it's unfortunate that we have not been able to see that level of progress in sports exchange, but I think that we can all benefit if even now we can have a sports exchange between the two Koreas. Yes, and I have to respond to the uh, question. And just to add, David Mitchell is in Trinity College, Dublin. When Ireland was colonized under the UK, that's when this school was founded. And when I was in Cambridge, uh, this is its name. Uh, Trinity College, Dublin got its name from there. But it's actually the full name is Trinity College, Dublin in uh, Belfast. And that's been the case for a while now. You asked about uh, sports and relationships and identities. As I mentioned before, in uh, Northern Ireland, do the schools teach different uh, sports depending on the orientation. So Gaelic sports for Irish schools and hurling in the Irish schools. If you are in a, going to a Protestant school, then you have really no opportunity to learn hurling or any of the Gaelic sports. In the case of rugby, it's an exception. There are always going to be exceptions because in the UK, uh, the sports are also uh, depending on the class status. For Catholic upper middle class people, they also play rugby because rugby is considered an upper middle class sport. Even before the Good Friday Agreement, there were uh, unified teams. And when they participated in the national tournaments and international tournaments, the Catholics would also cheer for uh, Protestants as well. If we look at Northern Ireland case, it's very important because there was a lot of a grassroots level unity. And in Korea, it cannot be exactly the same with the Northern Ireland case, but if uh, things improve, between the two Koreas, the uh, local governments and local municipalities can use uh, sports as a medium to try to foster uh, more uh, development. And I think that this bottom-up approach is going to be very meaningful. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I think unification is not some grand discourse. It, it really starts from small, realizable, actionable steps. If we present an argument that the DPRK can never accept, then that's just rhetoric. The DPRK developed Onsan, and they were going to have the groundbreaking ceremony, the opening ceremony, which was postponed because of COVID-19. It's all there, but uh, they could not open it yet. And I think that the 2024 Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games, through the uh, support committee, can uh, make the proposal to the DPRK that we will uh, help them and assist them in making use of the onsan facilities. This is something that we can realize. This is an actionable goal. 
And so Kangwamdo and the National Assembly and the government should all work together towards that end. The 2024 Kangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games, I hope to ask you for your appreciation and support. So I will use the next 15 seconds. So sports exchange is not everything. It's a double-edged sword. So it really requires further studies and research. So I'd like to thank uh, Governor Chim and Sun for being here. Let's try to uh, translate um, these in ideas into very specific initiatives and efforts. Thank you very much, um, our audience, as well as our online participant. Thank you all for joining us today. Hope that we will really create some tangible results going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, we weren't able to allocate more time for the session. But nonetheless, uh, we had a very important discussion, sharing valuable opinions and insights with one another. I'd like to thank all the panelists. And this concludes sports session two. We'll begin DMZ Peace Zone promotion session uh, starting at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. We look forward to your continued participation and interest. Thank you.